morning and welcome to the second day of the IIT 2022, where we're discussing inter-regional cooperation for effective internationalization of higher education. This is the second day and we have a day filled with very interesting sessions and uh, esteemed speakers. Uh, I just uh, am here to welcome all the delegates, uh, all the academia from across the world and of course India and our esteemed speakers. I'm very, very happy with this session on knowledge diplomacy uh, because this is a session which we have been discussing for several years. And we always believe that internationalization of higher education and international relations actually go hand in hand. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Muzumdar sir spoke about this and he also mentioned that, uh, you know, let us ask ourselves a question, why do we want to internationalize higher education? And that's when we come back to this uh, whole concept of knowledge diplomacy. And India has played a major role in uh, being a, kind of a soft power with so many students, foreign students who have passed out of the portals of various Indian universities uh, and have become heads of states, diplomats and assumed important positions. And I'm sure that has also helped the Indian government in uh, you know, many, many strategic decisions that uh, you know, across countries that may have been taken. But today we have uh, distinguished uh, speakers and I'm so glad that two of our uh, distinguished professors, Ambassador Gautam Bambavale and Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed are here along with uh, His Excellency, uh, Dr. Montero. Uh, so we're going to have uh, indeed a very, uh, you know, enriching session, I would say. This is probably for the first time that we are discussing knowledge diplomacy on a public platform. While we teach this in our School of International Studies that uh, Professor Shivali Lawale heads, but on a public platform, this discourse is going to be extremely uh, interesting. So thank you very much. And uh, Shivali, uh, best of luck for the conduct of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, so very good morning to everyone. Um, the session, Knowledge Diplomacy, Leveraging International Higher Education Research and Innovation to Solve Global Issues is very timely. Today, the world faces innumerable challenges, as we are all aware, that range from climate change, post migrations and deglobalization, to name just a few. We believe that education, in fact, the education sector, can provide solutions to these challenges through effective partnerships and collaborations. This session is going to be a very, very interesting one. And uh, before I uh, request the distinguished chair, Ambassador Gautam Bambavale to take the session forward, let me just take a minute to introduce him. Ambassador Gautam Bambavale is a career diplomat who joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1984. He was India's ambassador to Bhutan, Pakistan, and China. Ambassador Bambavale was stationed in Washington, D.C. from 2004 to 2007 during the Indo-U.S. nuclear deal, which transformed ties between the two countries. He has been India's first Council General in Guangzhou, so please forgive me if I've mispronounced that, uh, that name, that, uh, the, the name of the city. From 2007 to 2009, he was also the director of the Indian Cultural Center in Berlin from 1994 to 1998. Ambassador Bambavale worked in the Prime Minister's office from 2002 to 2004. At the Ministry of External Affairs, he was Joint Secretary for East Asia from 2009 to 2014. Ambassador Bambavale has dealt with China for 15 years of his 34-year diplomatic career. Currently, Ambassador Bambavale is the Distinguished Professor at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Symbiosis International University. So, Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Dr. Shivali Lovely. Uh, well, to all the participants, let me start by saying once again, a very warm welcome to what is uh, what we have described in our program as track three of this conference over the last two days. And the title, as Dr. Vidya Yarovdekar rightly pointed out, the title of today's track three discussion is knowledge diplomacy, leveraging international higher education research and innovation to solve global issues. So as all of you know, global issues, as has been pointed out, are things like uh, the pandemic, which hit us over two years ago, things like uh, global climate change, uh, warming up of the atmosphere, et cetera. 
So these are global issues which um, impact every individual across the globe. Now, if we take a look at what has happened over the last two years, and I'm focusing entirely on the COVID pandemic, how, how did individual countries react to the pandemic, to the rise of COVID and the spread of COVID across the world? And the answer to that, as we all know, is very, very simple. Each and every country across the globe, and I think there are no exceptions to this, each and every country across the globe turned inward. They closed their doors. They stopped travel both into their country and abroad from their country. They locked down cities. They locked down people. So the reaction to the pandemic was to hem each of one of us, each country in, to lock your doors, to close inward, to look inward. And it was exactly the opposite of what our proposition today is, which is that knowledge diplomacy should hopefully, um, through leveraging international higher education, research and innovation, help solve global issues. In other words, the experience of the pandemic is that each nation tried to handle the pandemic on its own, rather than cooperating with other countries. This was the initial reaction of each and every nation across the globe. This was also true where the development of new medicines, where the development of new medication, where the development of new vaccinations, inoculations against COVID-19 was concerned. Each country tried to develop uh, inoculation, vaccination, medication uh, for this new um, scourge called COVID-19 on their own. And they did not share this with others till much later down the line. So the question arises whether such a global issue as a pandemic or even climate change would be handled better through international cooperation rather than each country trying to go, on, uh, go out on its own. And that's the big question which we're discussing today. Um, there are also other global problems as we have discussed, whether it is climate change or whether it is other issues where we need to ask this question, whether we need cooperation on a global scale rather than each country trying to go on its own. So the question that this track seeks to answer is whether international higher education, research and innovation aids knowledge diplomacy and through it, will it foster a cooperative approach to global problems? Now, please remember that experts on this subject of knowledge diplomacy, and especially knowledge diplomacy and soft power, make a clear distinction between the two. While there is a whole degree of overlap, there is also a big distinction between the two. As all of you know, soft power is the ability of a nation, of a country, to influence the thinking of other people, other countries, other uh, people from across the globe to its own way of looking at things. So the very clear example in today's world is that of the United States, where people who go to the US to study there become very similar to the way of thinking that exists in the United States. So international higher education, uh, in this case, in, in the United States, does help in expanding the US's soft power. But knowledge diplomacy is slightly different from this soft power. Knowledge diplomacy is to foster a cooperative approach to um, global challenges, to international challenges. So I make this distinction between knowledge diplomacy and soft power as most social scientists do. And let us now delve into this whole question about whether international higher education research and innovation can actually foster um, a cooperative attitude uh, and expand knowledge diplomacy across the globe. And to discuss this very interesting subject, of course, we have two um, very distinguished experts. The first is, of course, uh, um, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad, who is India's former ambassador 
to Oman, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. He is also distinguished professor here at Symbiosis University, but he's joining us today uh, from Delhi, where he lives and works. And he has uh, very recently uh, come out with a very interesting book uh, on, um, on diplomacy, which uh, I will let him talk about a little more if he does. Uh, but uh, we have, of course, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad, and then we have Ambassador Claudio Montero, who is the serving ambassador of, the, of Costa Rica to India. He too is, I believe, joining us from Delhi. But uh, let me first give the floor to Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad. And as has been pointed out by the organizers, I have to be very strict with both of you gentlemen. You have 15 minutes each because we'd like to have a question and answer session at the end of it. So the floor is yours, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad. Your 15 minutes starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gautam. Thank you for the invitation to Symbiosis. Before I talk about knowledge diplomacy, let me first give you an overview of the world in which we are. This is a world of competition confrontation and conflict. Indeed, we are experiencing a very major global conflict which Russia has recently defined as the Third World War. There are deep divisions globally, regionally, and domestically. Uh, regionally and uh, globally, we have geopolitical divisions, ideological divisions. And very often these are based on identity-based identity -based contentions where individuals and groups are asserting to gain power for the kind of grouping they have put together. This grouping could be based on race, a subnationalism, faith, or what have you. But this is a period of extraordinary global contention. After 40 years of the Cold War and 30 years of the post-Cold War era, we are today poised for a significant change in world order. Why has this happened? It has happened largely because of the breakdown of globalization. Globalization for a short period had engendered a kind of cooperation. So cooperation in economic terms, uh, in terms of movement of uh, ideas, movement of technology, movement of information and finance, and, or movement of people. That has broken down. And that has broken down largely because of certain major domestic issues. Large numbers of people at home were not part of the success story engendered by globalization. But globalization also broke down because of concerns in the developed world that their monopoly over power over global power based on technology, finance, and information control is now likely to be challenged. And that this challenge is coming from non-Western sources. And there was therefore a shattering down immediately of this and adoption of a confrontationist approach. Therefore, there are two reasons. There are the domestic and the global. And this is what we are contending with today. It's a very untidy, indeed anarchic global order in which we are involved today. It is in this situation that we are talking about education of knowledge diplomacy. Knowledge diplomacy is uh, reaching out beyond borders, reaching out in terms of uh, putting together shared paradigms of, uh, uh, of consensus. Let us see what the record has been. The record, as we have already noted, has been quite poor because the ability to share across borders is almost negligible. There is a very deep reluctance to share. Share on equal basis. There is, of course, the buying and selling. If I have produced something of a certain value, I'm quite happy to sell it, but I will not share the technology. Sharing of technology has been of very, very limited value. Again, with regard to health, my colleague Gautam has already sketched out a record is it been extremely poor and remains poor. Large parts of the world, including Africa and Latin America, are indeed excluded almost entirely uh, from any ameliorative action to be taken by the international community. 
even with regard to climate change, which is supposed to bring all of us together on the same platform. We've already seen in context of the Ukraine conflict that immediately we have gone back to conventional fuels and that we are facing an energy crisis directly created by the contending power, the United States. What then are we supposed to share? Values? We are being told that this ongoing conflict in the world centered around Ukraine is supposed to be the liberal order versus authoritarianism. And I'm a little bemused by this liberal order. Liberal order is a very contested territory and there is no consensus even within countries as to what constitutes this liberal order. And when you talk of a rules-based order, which is what is expounded robustly by Washington, I've not seen Washington adopt any of the rules that they expound. They are, in fact, the greatest breaker of international order and leave behind a trail of extraordinary devastation as they go forward with immunity and devastate, destroy entire communities and civilizations and put to death several hundred thousand people. India, too, is passing through this crisis. What we have uh, debates ongoing with regard to what is our identity? Who are we? What is the idea that unites all of us and makes us Indian? It is contested territory. What are our national interests? So far, we have uh, expounded on a strategic autonomy, and yet there is a powerful movement that is pushing us into the American embrace. And then what should be the people? What kind of alignment should we have globally? Who should be our friends? Again, that is contested territory. And the robust votaries of United States affiliation are today working full time to push us deeper and deeper into the American embrace as if that is the magic wand that India has been wanting, has been waiting for, for its national salvation. Completely opposite of what is truly the ethos of India. In this context, where do we then go in terms of knowledge diplomacy? What India needs is a clarity of purpose. Who are we? What do we bring to the global table? What are the values that we have, we have nurtured in this land of ours over several thousand years and today have made us unique and in a position to share there has to be clarity on this. And not only clarity, there has to be national consensus in this regard as to what makes us Indian. And once we have that, we should also have clarity of what we want to be. What is our role in world affairs? What are the resources that we are bringing? The magic wand of aligning with the West is not the answer. The West has been a global exploit. The West has been a very dominant force for the devastation of the other. And today, let us be very clear, regardless of the terminologies used in different Western capitals, as far as they are concerned, it is the West. Have you not heard this word so frequently over the last uh, few months, few weeks? The West. The West is said to Western value, West this, West that. As if, therefore, it is very clear. For me, it is the assertion of the status quo, the assertion of the imperialist, colonialist power to ensure that their global hegemony is not challenged. It is in this framework that India has to come up with certain fresh ideas. And I think these ideas are already deeply enshrined in our ethos. The ideas of what is, and these ideas are also linked with our foreign policy. What is India's strategic space? India's strategic space is Eurasia, the entire landscape of Asia and of Africa and the Indian Ocean. This is our space. It is not the West and it is not the United States. It is in this context. So where do we go from here? What is knowledge diplomacy then? And what are we then to go forward with? We have to go knowledge. Knowledge diplomacy means first acquiring knowledge. Do we have that knowledge? We have very little knowledge of our strategic space. How many of us even know the names of countries of Central Asia or the capitals of countries of Africa? We in Zimbabwe have every reason to be proud. 
our own international studies program has imparted this knowledge very robustly over several years and produced young people who today are ranging forward, not just in India, but beyond with this knowledge base. And now this master's course that we have initiated with regard to African studies is another very significant initiative where we are going forward with knowledge diplomacy, understanding our landscape, the landscape that is crucial for us. And this is where our future lies as a nation and as a people. Now, we know the cliches are all there and I'm embarrassed to repeat them. We should pursue excellence. We should learn best practices, etc. But none of this actually happens. Conference after conference, we give lip service to these terminologies. But there is a problem. And the problem must also be recognized that higher education is the culmination of an education process. It comes at the end. It has to undo the damage of so much other input that has already occurred and severely retarded the capacity of individuals to actually learn from best practices and pursue excellence. We are trained in conformity and mediocrity. We are trained in thinking narrow. We are, think, we are trained to focus on the, on the person, on the individual, and of our little groups. Do we have that kind of education and can the university correct it at the fag end of education? At the last two or three years when we have these young people with us, we have to overnight correct all the damage that has been done by the family, the school, and the undergraduate course, and then make them global citizens capable of pursuing, understanding the national interest and then pursuing it. So this is a very major problem area. The problem is even further compounded. The university doesn't function in isolation. The university is an integral part of the political landscape and is therefore buffeted by the various contentions that happen at home. And constantly we have various issues that come and narrow the scope of the university. If on the one hand we are told that we pursue liberal values, values that are accommodative, values that bring people together, the reality is that the, the reality of the political landscape is that it narrows the vision rather than broadens it. So we have that concern as well. So what should the university do? The university must broaden the identity, broaden the provision, broaden the understanding, and make us truly effective role players in the knowledge diplomacy that is now central for us. I think India is capable of playing that role. We have the institutions, we have the minds, we have the potential. It just needs a certain clarity and direction. Let us be very clear where we want to go. This is our landscape. Look at the map. The map is of Asia, Africa, and the Indian Ocean. It does not include the West, and it does not include the United States. They have an agenda that has nothing to do with us. And before I end, let me quietly remind all of you, that these great bastions of liberalism, when it suits them, and when they find someone is not cooperating with them and doing their bidding, that is when the knives come out. And we have this petty official from the United States who happens to be of Indian origin, who descends upon Delhi and from the podium threatens his mother country and says, there will be consequences if you do not accommodate us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad, for some thought-provoking ideas. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think let us now turn to our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Ambassador Claudio Montero, the serving ambassador of Costa Rica to India. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Your 15 minutes starts now. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can see me because I'm having problems with the camera. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear, Ambassador. We can't see you, but uh, please do go ahead. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to greet our Chair, former Ambassador Tom Bambawel, my fellow speaker, former Ambassador Talmiz Samad, 
our moderator, Shivali Nawal, and the esteemed audience that has joined us today. It's an honor to be part of this discussion. Our sincere appreciation to Symbiosis International University for the invitation and for the organization of this important event. How to achieve an effective internationalization of higher education is a key topic that pertains not only to India, but to all countries in the world. How do we improve the quality of our education and they increase the exposure of our faculty and students to a more international academic dimensions that involves not only teaching, but also collaborating in research as well as in, in the implementation of programs involving different services to society? How do we promote the mobility of students to and from our universities, expand our programs, pursue agreements and memorandum of understanding promote publications in academic journals with impact in key areas. These matters have inevitably become a great relevance to, our, to all nations, thus encouraging the push for our national higher education institutions to cross borders and go international. This, as we all know, has resulted in higher numbers of international students across the globe. The creation of a wide variety of programs, including online options, a stronger driver of universities to improve their position in the global rankings, more cooperation agreements, among others. The bigger question, however, is, and this brings me to the specific topic of our panel, how we can leverage the current global knowledge product, production and sharing in high, higher education to solve global issues. That is, how can the internationalization of higher education provide an effective service to society, to our global community? For this, it's necessary for internationalization of higher education to focus on its strategic, comprehensive, and global issues, rather than being driven by specific national or local issues. Academic exchanges and cooperation should therefore be great geared towards promoting peace and mutual understanding, achieving green, inclusive and resilient economies, human development and combating climate change and poverty. Among many other challenges that our world continues to face, these topics must not be pushed to the sidelines, but rather be a main target of the internationalization of our higher education. And I must add to the, a little comment to the, what um, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad said, that we should not only think of East and West, but also of North and South, because South has many uh, things in common that we can share and we can cooperate to precisely change that vision of the liberal state and that vision of the, of the crisis that this liberal state uh, has shown and is recently uh, broken in a war in Ukraine. So we should think not only in terms of our geographic, our geopolitical uh, surroundings, but also think of the North and South dimensions that are very important. So the question is how do we encourage our students and faculty to bring solutions to pressing global challenges? To start with, it's necessary that the curriculum gives specific priority to these matters, especially to the utmost function of higher education, which should be enhancing the quality of education and research to make meaningful contributions to society. We need to unite the universities to the needs of the community, of the needs of the society. Uh, up to now, maybe because of this liberal perspective that we have followed, a university has become like a like an isolated tower of knowledge and not integrated enough with the rest of society. A specific, I would like to now to give you a, a brief introduction about Costa Rica and its higher education. As you may be aware, Costa Rica is a Central American country of 5.1 million habit, inhabitants that despite its small size has led by example and internationally recognized for its leadership in human rights protection, peace and democracy and environmental policies. Our educational system is recognized as one of the best in Latin America since 1869. 
public primary education in our country was made free and mandatory by constitution, 8% of our GDP must be spent on public education. We have one of the highest rates of literacy, 98% educational coverage and public spending in education in Latin America. We are also one of the top destinations for studying abroad in Latin America, especially for students from US and Europe. We have five public universities, among which our leading institution, which is named University of Costa Rica, has been rated number one in Central America and the Caribbean, as well as one of the 500 top universities of the world, which includes 7,500 universities. Our education sector also includes a growing number of private universities. We have 54 of them right now. <coughs> Costa Rica has long understood that our main resource is the talent and education of our people and that we need to provide the necessary capacities for our people to face the challenges of modern world. Given the importance of education in our country, it is not surprising that one of the main focuses of Costa Rican foreign policy deals with innovation, knowledge, and education diplomacy. As part of our innovation, knowledge, and education diplomacy, Costa Rica earnestly promotes international opportunities and partnerships that may contribute to an inclusive, resilient, sustainable, and decarbonized economic development, facilitate cultural exchange, and promote scientific and technological development. These efforts include both the promotion of strategic alliances to support foreign policy priorities in global and regional forums, as well as the fostering of partnerships to contribute to our country's sustainable development. <coughs> so coming back to our panel's specific question on how the internationalization on higher education can contribute to solving global issues, we believe funding and efforts must be placed to combat climate change to achieve an inclusive, resilient, sustainable, and decarbonized economic recovery, and to continue promoting scientific and technological development. The impact of scientific research and collaboration has become over more evident in recent years with the, fly, with the fight against the pandemic. On this note, I would like to mention the example of a prominent Costa Rican scientist, Dr. Eugenia Corrales Aguilar, Professor and researcher of the Faculty of Microbiology in the University of Costa Rica and the Center for Research and Tropical Diseases, who won international funding and recognition for the study to identify neutralizing antibodies against COVID. Developing a strong network with a scientific diaspora is essential, and embassies play a key role in this regard. We must enhance the role, the role of the diaspora as scientific advisors and their potential to enable links with global networks, as well as to strengthen the science diplomacy agenda that can be effectively address our country's challenges and opportunities. <coughs> Sorry. Technology and knowledge transfer between higher education and industry is also a key factor to consider as it has potentials to encourage innovation and product development for the benefit of society. But behind all this, we should foster the values of solidarity, compassion, and equal opportunities for all among all developing nations. Thank you. And I'm open for questions or more comments. Thank you. Thank you very much to both our speakers, Ambassador Claudio Montero, who just spoke, the serving ambassador of uh, Costa Rica to India. And of course, to our earlier speaker, Dr. Talmiz Ahmad, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad, um, who's, who also spoke earlier. Um, let me start by uh, discussing a few thoughts which your uh, speeches made me uh, think of. And I would also like to uh, tell and ask all the audience members, uh, all the participants, that if you can, uh, and if you have any questions, please do put them into the question box. Please put them into the chat box so that I can pose those questions to our two distinguished guests. But uh, uh, let me start with Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad and ask him the following question. You know, when we think of internationalization of higher education, and as you know, sir, that we at uh, Symbiosis 
this is a very important aspect of symbiosis. This is a very important part of symbiosis that we are looking at uh, getting students from other countries. Now, um, we also, in our experience, we know that while there are a large number of students who come from around us, from our neighboring countries, whether it's Nepal, whether it is Bhutan, Sri Lanka, uh, we also have students from Africa and some from Southeast Asia. But the experience is also that we do get students from the West who want to study, say, for example, computers or information technology. They want to do a semester at an Indian university, or they may even want to do internships here at Indian universities. So when you say that we should not look at the West, should we stop such students from coming? Or should we keep the door open from them, for them too? How should we at Symbiosis and other universities who are represented in this uh, conference go about Indian universities? How should we go about uh, attracting students from abroad. Ambassador Talmi Zamal, please. There is no suggestion in my remarks that we should shut our doors and windows. In fact, my message is exactly the opposite. We must open our doors and windows, open our minds, and get people from diverse backgrounds to come and see us at our best. There is no question of not wanting someone else to come. What I don't want to see is that we get swept off our feet. There used to be a time after independence when young people from India used to go abroad to study because we did not have adequate institutions, and then they would come back. Today, you have an opposite scenario. My concern is about that, that we produce, our educational institutions produce young people who then go abroad and work there. That means we take upon ourselves the responsibility of education but the benefits of that education are taking place somewhere else. That is what I'm concerned about. And that is what I'm opposed to. This allure of the West. We have so many people whose heart beats for India, but it beats fastest when they are in California. And that is it. The great flag of India, California. And nobody ever asked them, what are you doing there? You should be here. Okay, India is not the most perfect place and there are struggles. This is where you belong. And this is where you must contribute the maximum that you can. I am opposed to this shift that we produce the young people and they contribute to somebody else. Somebody else. United States became the country that it has become overwhelmingly because of these migrants who have come there. And I accept that. So we are a free country. You can go wherever you wish to work, but don't come back to me and claim your Indian heritage and then preach to me how I should be running my country or what I should be thinking about. That is not acceptable to me again. So I have two concerns here. One is that I produce the people, all my national resources, producers, engineers, and doctors, and architects, and uh, rocket scientists, and they go west and work there and contribute. Okay, do that if you wish. I don't like it, but I can't stop you. But don't come back to me and believe you have a claim upon me. You don't. You have made your choice and you belong elsewhere. Thank you, Ambassador Talmi Zamad, for that uh, clarification. Let me uh, turn to Ambassador Claudio Montero and ask him, sir, you have seen universities and you gave us a very good exposition on how um, higher education is handled in Costa Rica. You have also experienced, and uh, I do hope you get a chance. I don't know if you have visited us in Pune at our lovely campus. Let me, on behalf of the authorities, I can see them both sitting uh, for this conference, but let me, on behalf of them, invite you to our university. We have one of the greenest campuses in India. Uh, but let me ask you, Ambassador Montero, that you know, given your experience of both Indian universities and Costa Rican universities, where do you think Indian universities can strengthen their international cooperation part of their work? And how do we go about getting more foreign students to come to our universities? Ambassador Montero, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Symbiosis. Uh, I visited uh, Symbiosis University, I think it was in last October or November. Sorry, and I didn't know that. So uh, I apologize, but invite you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the visit there. And uh, 
and we had a great discussions uh, with the authorities uh, of your university. And, uh, and what we did ask it was for complete scholarships. Uh, and let me let me go back again with uh, with a comment uh, to Mr. Tamil uh, Ambassador Tamil. Uh, what he just said, which I understand that when you refer to the West, you're thinking of U.S. only. But the West is more than United States. And you that's why I feel that that same um, a concept of uh, thinking uh, like the uh, Im imperial domination of, uh, of the West over the East uh, is, is, is also in, in, in that discourse of his, because when you think of West, you're only thinking of US and you're leaving out Latin America. I don't see Latin America at all. One of the things that, uh, that I, uh, I saw in the flags that you have painted in the buildings of uh, symbiosis was that my, my country, for example, wasn't there. The flag of Costa Rica wasn't painted there. And so I said, what's, what's wrong? What's, uh, is Latin America part of, uh, of your interest of uh, including Latin American uh, students in your university? Or are you just thinking of, of certain Western countries? And so that's part of our also colonial mentality of not seeing the, the problem from North and South also. You know, South-South cooperation can be of great, of great help in changing these uh, stereotypes. And we should do more cooperation between South-South, Latin America and India, for example, which have a lot of things in common. I always, I always uh, 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 say two or three things that, uh, that I think that are very important of, of, of values that we share with India. One is the value of democracy. You are the largest democracy in the world and we are the oldest democracy in Latin America. The values of peace. Your independence came through a peaceful movement and Gandhi was a leader of this uh, peaceful movement, by the way, trained in England uh, and came back to precisely change things here in India. Same thing with Nehru. Nehru was trained as a lawyer in, uh, in, in, in England and came back to the colony to work for the independence. So not everybody that has been, been trained in the West has the, that mentality of, you know, of uh, coming to lecturing only and putting some values that are not the local values. So we have also a, that value of peace that is very important. You know, after our civil war in 1948, one year after your independence, we, we had a civil war and the, the ones that won the war, who was a leader called Pepe Figueres, he, he uh, had a government of six months only, made some reforms. And among those reforms, he abolished the army. And we have become the first and only country in the world that voluntarily have abolished the army. And that abolishment of the army has allowed us to spend more money in education and health. And that could be uh, something very interesting to uh, spread around and do a lot of cooperation between countries of the South, like India and Costa Rica or India and Latin America. So uh, I think there's a lot to be done there in terms of research, in terms of exchange of students, exchange of uh, staff on these uh, uh, exchange programs of maybe uh, a semester or a year, or even uh, a master's degree of two years, you know? The problem is that because of this mentality of maybe uh, um, thinking only of going to study in Europe or US, we leave out other opportunities and the students don't see that, that there are other opportunities
to go study and learn uh, from countries that have even uh, more things in common. Like, for example, coming to India for uh, Costa Rican students uh, is not a priority. And we want to change that. How can we change that so that they consider India also as a, as a, as a place to come and, and then study? Well, we have to give them more incentives. We have to give them more uh, complete scholarships so that maybe the, 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 the students from lower income families can be attracted to come to India. And we would love to have more intercultural exchange of artists that we can send Indian artists to Latin America and Costa Rica specifically, and also bring artists uh, to India because sharing cultural values also is the most important diplomacy that we can do. That's how we bring together the people of our country. So those are some of the ideas I can give you right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Montero, for those ideas. Um, I want to turn to the chat box where we have a few questions and please keep those questions coming. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Azmat Khan and it's uh, addressed to Ambassador Talmi Zamad. And let me just read out the question to you, Ambassador Talmi Zamad. Why can't we think of people studying in India and then going to the West as outreach volunteers? They spread Indian ethos, Indian culture. They extend India's soft power worldwide. So how would you react to this uh, idea and suggestion, Ambassador Talmi Zamad, please? I'm not sure there is a category of visas called outreach volunteers. Our people in the West don't believe they have anything to learn from others. There is no category like that of outreach volunteers that you can go and then spread Indian ethos, etc. Having said this, what we do have is a very traditional, it's been going on now for several decades, uh, cultural diplomacy. We have that. Is quite successful. Uh, it is uh, uh, very often sponsored by government, but increasingly the private sector is also involved. And large aspects of our of our ethos are uh, conveyed uh, to uh, various countries. Uh, we have a good tradition of the festivals of India uh, in various capitals, which have been uh, going on for several years. Uh, we have uh, scholars moving back and forth, participating in conferences. Uh, we have a um, lot of academic interaction. All of that is happening. Let's not use the word outreach volunteer. Uh, we have uh, interaction broadly in the, under the rubric of cultural diplomacy. It is already taking place. We also have movements of students, uh, various ministries in India. Uh, the Ministry of Youth and Sports uh, organizes visits of young people who go to other countries and see how the countries are functioning uh, and uh, come back with a certain perspective relating to that country. And we also have, uh, you know, our films participate in uh, film festivals. So we have film festivals in India and we have our cinema going abroad. So there is a lot already happening, uh, uh, which is uh, quite successful. Uh, but as I pointed out, and I must raise this uh, point of caution, there is no consensus about what should be projected and in what way. It's, a, it's contested territory. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad. Let me um, just in response to Ambassador Montero's point that when he visited us uh, at the university in Pune, there was no flag of Costa Rica. Uh, Ambassador, you're absolutely right. The flags which are up there are those of countries whose students are studying at our university. So we hope to see the flag of Costa Rica quickly. Uh, we hope to have some students from your country uh, studying here at Symbiosis. And then the flag of Costa Rica will be also amongst all those other flags which you see at our university campus in Lovely. But uh, one of the very important points which Ambassador Montero made was that there is a need for uh, comprehensive scholarships, especially for bright but needy students. And if I could, I can see that Dr. Vidya is uh, part of our discussion. Uh, recently, we had this question also from our neighbor Bhutan, 
So let me uh, turn to her and request her to sort of address this issue and what we at Symbiosis can do to bring in students from Costa Rica who may be needy or students from other neighbors like Bhutan. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Mambavale. Uh, so, uh, Ambassador uh, Claudio, I would like to inform you that we do have scholarships for foreign students uh, who are generally recommended. We give those scholarships to uh, students who are recommended by the embassies. Uh, so, in case you have such needy but talented students, we can certainly look at the scholarship program. We have a specific scholarship program for African students, and we see many African students, and earlier we had for even Afghanistan students uh, who used to come in large numbers. Even today, uh, we have a program called Engage Africa in which we provide 100% scholarships, sometimes 50% scholarships. Apart from this, let me also inform you that the Indian government has launched the Study in India program. And through this program, the government of India provides scholarships to uh, not just public institutions and universities, but even to private universities. So there are a lot of students who come through the government of India scholarship uh, you know, to Symbiosis International University. Uh, and I fully agree with you. We definitely need to develop a more South-South collaboration. In fact, yesterday we had a whole session on this South-South-North collaborations. And through this, we can certainly look at how we can bring in Latin America closer to India. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vidya. There is a question in the chat box, which is uh, addressed to both the ambassadors, to our speakers. And the question is as follows. It's from Dr. Polly Lama. Do you think a university should have a ceiling budget limit for global educational diplomacy? Meaning that is the budget masking our country and creating a brain drain? Should we invest more on social exposure of our university? So the basic idea, should there be a ceiling for global educational diplomacy at our universities here in India or maybe even abroad? So let me, uh, this is for both the ambassadors. Let me uh, go to Ambassador Claudio Montero first and then request Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad. Ambassador Montero, the, uh, if I could request you to answer this question first. Thank you. Um, no, I, I, I think uh, uh, there should not be a ceiling of, uh, of a budget to, to encourage uh, students abroad, uh, either from India to other countries and from other countries to India. I think uh, even should be even uh, broader and uh, larger. Uh, that's precisely the point that I was making, and I'm glad that that uh, that Symbiosis has a, a program and a budget for this, and also the government of India has a budget for this. Uh, the problem is that sometimes the budget is not used. It's not used for some other reasons that we have to find out. Uh, why is it that, that people from abroad, from Latin America in this case, don't choose India to come here? And they prefer to go to the uh, Europe or United States uh, because that has a lot of uh, structural reasons of you know of employment. It has uh, a, a, some other reasons of status and also of the rankings that they are also manipulated and done by uh, like what the Tamil Mr. Ambassador Tamil would say. Western type of rankings, you know, that put universities in Europe and, and, and US as the first. And the criteria there sometimes is very narrow. And so uh, we have to then maybe change that uh, vision that the universities also in India or in Latin America can be as good or even better than the uh, teachings and, 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 and academic um, uh, levels that you can find in Europe or United States. So we have to we have to market our countries, our universities much better. And for that, I think the budget should be even larger. Thank you, Ambassador Montero. Ambassador Ahmad. Uh, there seem to be two issues here. One is with regard to, to students engaging with each other within the environment of the university. And the other is projecting a nation's ethos in another environment. The role of the university is with regard to the first, and that is how we can expand our knowledge and understanding 
uh, with regard to other countries. And I had mentioned specifically the Africa program that uh, Symbiosis, our School of International Studies has initiated. It's a pioneering initiative and it's a two year master's program and it is very rich in content because it brings in the politics, the economic, the culture. Even as I speak to you, I cannot help recalling uh, what, how rich African literature is. You know, within one year, they have got the Nobel Prize and the Booker and several other awards in France. They got the uh, writer from Senegal got the, uh, the French, the highest French award. So there is an extraordinary content right there. And these kind of programs are very helpful. And uh, the plan that we have of actually getting input from Africa, you know, teachers from Africa, people speak. This is one of the great advantages of the online interaction that with, the, you know, you can get the best people in the world to address our problems. And we should also, therefore that is already happening. And I think that is the way to go forward. With regard to pro using students to promote our ethos and culture, I think that's a little, it's not going to be easy. It's, no, it's a bit untidy because that is where you find governments take the initiative to a far greater extent. And actually it's the government's responsibility to provide these scholarship programs and all. And I think India is a lead role player in that regard. And we do have a lot of programs where we encourage students to come. I agree with the ambassador from Costa Rica that there is a certain neglect of Latin American studies in India. I mean, we could do better. Uh, the interactions, they have started only recently, the interactions, I would say in the last two or three decades, there has been a certain greater interest. And I have personally seen how uh, our economic ties have expanded. Uh, and uh, we have a lot, lot of movement taking place between India and Latin, different Latin American countries. But also there is the problem of geography. Let's be very objective here. As far as Latin American countries are concerned, their El Dorado is United States and possibly Canada, not other countries. But having said this, I do believe, uh, I did not include Latin America in my strategic space, but I have to include it in my economic and cultural space as far as India is concerned. You know, even a rudimentary exposure to Latin American writing, you know, the authors who have written there from Latin America, very often not known here, what extraordinary minds they have been, what an extraordinarily rich culture, cinema, cinema, literature, poetry, it is completely overwhelming. And I think, yes, it would be to our advantage, our mutual advantage of for Latin America and India to be more robustly uh, uh, interacting with each other. Uh, I know there is the issue of geography and it's not easy to get across uh, from one part from India to all the way to Latin America, but it's something that can and should be done. And Latin America itself would also need to show a fresh orientation, a far greater interest uh, in getting away from this heavy monstrosity in the North and getting away. Yes, it's much easier to speak of South-South cooperation, but let's see it happening in reality. Uh, I would love to see. Uh, so it's a, it's a two-way traffic. It cannot be that India shows all the enthusiasm for Latin America, but Latin America's eyes remain northward rather than eastward. It is. It has to be done by by both of us together. Greater engagement, uh, greater dialogue, uh, uh, multifaceted interactions. I think that's the way to go forward. Master Bambavale, uh, if yes, I may, please. there are there are a couple of questions in the chat box. In fact, this would flow very well. In, in fact, it will it will. Uh, said very well with uh, Ambassador Ahmed's remarks. There's a question from Aprajita Mishra. Uh, how can knowledge diplomacy contribute uh, to achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development? And I think maybe we could, uh, if I may, uh, sir, with your permission, the, with the permission please, of please. the chair. Yeah, uh, please, so please. I think this, this question could be uh, directed to uh, Ambassador Montero. Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, that question, thank you for the question, is very important. Um, how can we achieve uh, the sustainability goals in 2030 with uh, this uh, knowledge diplomacy and education diplomacy? Uh, one, I would stress the, what I've said about 
South-South cooperation uh, by the topics that we have to choose and make a priority in our curriculums, which is climate change, which is uh, poverty reduction, uh, inequality reduction, and all of these goals that the sustainable goals of uh, United Nations have uh, established, uh, those have to be achieved global, in a global way. And uh, the more that we exchange our knowledge by these programs of uh, student exchanges and professor exchanges and all of these, we will be enriched by different views and different cultural perspectives that would enable them to obtain these goals much faster. This is something the globalization has brought us uh, to the awareness that we have only one spaceship and we have to take care, all of us have to take care and we have the same common objective of survival and also of making the life of our children and our grandchildren much better. And we're not doing that. So we have to start by getting to know each other, getting to know each other culturally and uh, sharing all our knowledges from different perspectives and different topics and different dif disciplines in order to achieve in a holistic way all of these sustainable development goals. So uh, let me, uh, you know, uh, I think both the ambassadors have spoken very eloquently, but let me ask you that how do we come to the, you know, from the macro level to the micro level? I want to ask you for specific suggestions. What should Indian universities, and let's focus on India right now, what should Indian universities be doing to be able to attract more international students? What, what are the specific measures that we need to be taking? Let me start with Ambassador Talmi Zamad and then go to Ambassador Montero. Uh, since we have an ambassador from a Latin American country, and we are rightly focused on that, and as, which is as it should be, I would suggest that the Latin American, some of the Latin American ambassadors in Delhi should work in a cooperative manner instead of individual countries projecting their uh, interests, their culture, their education, their students, etc., in India, they should be done in a more cooperative manner. Let us admit straight away that the knowledge base in India relating to Latin America is almost negligent. And therefore, we have a long way to go. I must con convey with some regret, and I hope my colleague will not mind this, that I have not seen the kind of robust collective effort from Latin American ambassadors based in India that I would have liked to see. You know, uh, it has to be done a little collectively. If we were to leave it to individual countries, individual countries can do what they wish. But if a collective effort to project Latin American ethos, Latin American culture, cinema, poetry, art, literature, getting people across and talking to uh, their counterparts here. And in that education would be a major part possibly sponsor a Latin American chair. We don't have enough Latin American studies. We have some in Goa of a very rudimentary character and we could do better. But, and we've had in our own school, uh, we've had Latin American program over two or three days. But, uh, uh, but we can, we should get institutionalized. We do a lot of things uh, from time to time. So I would put, if you don't mind my saying, a major responsibility on the Latin American ambassadors here. They, I know that they meet together. Let them put this on their agenda. Let us see what they can do collectively. Put together an art exhibition or a speaking program or a Latin American week or Latin American fortnight, you know, in different parts of India, going across, visiting universities, getting individuals. I remember handling in the ICWA a similar program from Spain. They had a delegation of about 25 or 30 people. They had filmmakers, they had writers, they had poets, and uh, they had uh, professors, experts in foreign policy, et cetera, fanning out after a joint, some joint program, they fanned out across India. We coordinated that, fanned out to different parts of India. 
So filmmakers went and met filmmakers and film institute. Uh, writers met through Sahitya Academy. They met certain people. All of that was very well organized. And I think this is something that I would like the uh, Latin American ambassadors to do much more collectively than we have seen so far. That would be a very specific suggestion from my side. And there's a whole fertile territory out there. A, you will find Indians deeply interested in you. Uh, we, uh, the great heroes we have in our country, um, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, I'm sure we are ready for a slight update in that regard. And you have, we have had this extraordinary writer, Pablo Neruda, and even more, I mean, I'm not pretending to have any knowledge, uh, but we have, you will find people in India deeply interested in the culture that you have to offer us. Ambassador Montero? Yes, definitely. I agree completely with uh, Ambassador Ahmad. Uh, you know, we have a group of, that is called the GRULAC, a group of Latin American and Caribbean countries. Uh, we get together, uh, but uh, for the last two years with the pandemic, it has been very difficult to have these type of festivals or um, a movie uh, and artist exhibition. Uh, but we are very willing to, to work on that. And um, we are planning to do some uh, this year or even for next year, uh, if we get the fundings for it. Uh, we, do, we were thinking even of uh, doing something uh, in a big scale with all Latin American countries, uh, showing art, uh, music, and, and, and a movie festival. Uh, but uh, that got delayed because of this uh, pandemic situation right now. But uh, we have that uh, in our agenda, and uh, we will uh, try to do a more collective things. I agree that that should be done, and not only bilateral. And um, that is a challenge sometimes, because uh, not all Latin American countries uh, think alike or uh, have a, a, a homogeneous position on things. Uh, we have a lot of uh, discrepancies uh, uh, ourselves, you know, um, which is, it wouldn't be the case for India, that is uh, uh, one country, uh, one country that, that takes a decision for itself. In our case, we're more than 34 countries and putting together 34 countries in agreement to do something is sometimes is a little bit difficult, but we will try, we'll do our best on that. However, I would like to stress that uh, uh, according to the, uh, answering your question of how can we do it in a micro level uh, is the scholarship programs. I think the scholarship program should be something, um, something that we should uh, at least get, you know, two students from Latin America in at least 10 universities of India. Uh, so that there is a presence of Latin Americans in India uh, permanently, permanently. And uh, we would love to exchange cultural, also um, experiences of artists, you know, so that musicians and artists, painters, um, and even a staff, a, a, a academic staff could, to, could be exchanged. Uh, <clears throat> at least if we could make a funding you know, a fund that, that would uh, award a prize for these artists to go to Latin America from India and from Latin America to India in a permanent way, like uh, have a, an award once a year for a couple of artists. Uh, that would also give also a lot of presence to, to that. Uh, one thing that, that, that I've uh, done here is to convince uh, ICCR uh, to donate a statue of Gandhi to put in Costa Rica, and that will be done very soon. I'm also trying to see if a university in Costa Rica has a, a, a center for Asian studies uh, that we should start uh, looking into that uh, much deeper since Asia has become the region of, uh, of most commerce and, um, and most uh, important with the rise of India and China, you know, it, it's very important for us to get closer to, to, to Asia. 
So there are a lot of things going on. Uh, however, uh, let's wait until uh, this pandemic uh, uh, excuse uh, is over so that we can start doing things uh, in a more collective way. But we need more funding. We would be, I think the way, best way is to get a fund, especially uh, for Latin American Indian exchange students and also uh, a, a cultural exchange. Uh, I'm gonna look into what the government has in terms of the uh, scholarships uh, that it offers. And uh, also <clears throat> uh, what I think is the problem is that there's some constraints in those scholarships. Uh, that, that, that's why they're not used so much, but uh, we have to get, uh, we have to overcome those, those limitations. And so <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can get the whole Latin American team to, to get into this uh, position and this view that I share with Dr. Ahmad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Montero. And I think... Uh, Ambassador Bambamir, if I may, if I may. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. There's one last question. We have three minutes. Uh, there's one last question uh, from Dr. Vidya. It's, and it's, it's for you. Uh, how does China use its soft power and is this the right way of diplomacy? Yeah, that's an excellent question, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Vidya. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I can bring in my little knowledge of China into this whole question. There is no doubt whatsoever that over the past 10, maybe even 15 years, that China has greatly expanded its uh, cohort of foreign students who study at various Chinese universities. In fact, uh, China's whole uh, methodology of financing uh, higher education, where each university has to increasingly take uh, a greater share. I mean, very little money is now coming from state coffers. More and more has to be raised by the university themselves. And one of the ways this is done is through getting international students. So there is very little doubt that uh, Chinese universities are now working actively to attract more and more uh, foreign students at higher educational institutions. Um, I My only problem is that I think the Chinese use these foreign students or use the presence of foreign students at Chinese universities to enhance their soft power. And therefore this distinction between soft power on the one hand and knowledge diplomacy on the other becomes very important. The Chinese are using, uh, are utilizing, let me say, uh, this um, uh, cohort of foreign students for enhancing and expanding their soft power. I don't think they're using them for knowledge diplomacy, which is a more cooperative approach. And as our, um, our, our track three is focusing on, is to use, use knowledge diplomacy and in international higher education research and innovation for solving global issues and global problems. So I think that's where uh, the dif distinction lies. And I hope that India, as we increase our cohort of foreign students, will be able to do the opposite of what the Chinese do that use the international students for, more for knowledge diplomacy and less for uh, enhancing and expanding and um, our own soft power, which will come automatically, by the way. So uh, I, 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 in fact, uh, thank you for asking that question. Let me also summarize that, you know, on this whole issue of uh, leveraging IHERI for uh, solution, solutions at a global level of global issues, uh, I think the uh, answer from our track three is that yes, it can uh, help in, uh, in, in knowledge diplomacy and solving global issues, uh, but uh, there is much more that universities, at least in India and in other parts of the third world, uh, need to do in attracting foreign students. So I'm going to stop there, uh, Shivali, and hand the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to thank Ambassador Montero, Ambassador Felonis Ahmed, and last but not least, the Chair. Thank you, Ambassador Gautam Bombardier, for this excellent session. It, the discussions were absolutely, I would say, very, very interesting. And I'm, I'm sure uh, our audience would have liked to ask, uh, you know, there are, I can see there are a lot more questions in the chat box which we haven't addressed. Uh, so thank you once again, and I'll hand the floor back to Dr. Anita Bajankar.
thank you, Shivali, for that uh, very insightful uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, esteemed panel.